Ballad 19, just commented, could have been written before lyric number two. In any case, it undoubtedly precedes lyric number three. Now, that is why I decided at a very late stage to make Manuele Granolati, who did the notes, that is, after each, each poem has a commentary, then comes the poem, and then there are the, the notes at the foot of the poem. I made, I came to a decision, and I made Lele go back and take out, he, he always in the notes referred to when he was making, a, 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 pointing out an echo between poems, he always would put the, the poem by number. I said, all numbers must go. All numbers must go. And then I made that a methodological principle, which I discuss in the introduction. Because the numbers reify the belief that, that, it's, that Dante did it, and that, that, that this is an actual correct practice. But those numbers are De Robertis. And that's why De Robertis actually has a whole funny section in which he says um, that he's, he's, he's got an ansia about the numbering because there have been previous numbering. Well, there was no reason to have an ansia about the numbering. It's not like Petrarca, when we say uh, 126 delle, uh, dei rerum vulgarium fragmenta, that means something because Petrarca put chiare fresche dolciaque in a specific position. He, he very deliberately transcribed that poem into position 126. That's his position. It's his authorial position, and it has hermeneutic significance. But due, tre, diciano, those had no significance whatsoever. And yet you can see De Robertis reifying that, and in that degree, reifying himself as the author rather than Dante. So not that I, I, I I'm not actually trying to, I'm not trying to disappear. One of, the, one of my points with De Robertis, he and I actually had a conversation when he came to the Cavalcanti conference quite a few years ago, it was before I had really started much, but I had been working on it, and, and I actually gave him the best tip. I, I went to see him and I said, you know, Professor De Robertis, you must include the Vita Nuova poems in your edition. Because I have read everything De Robertis ever wrote, and he says always that they were all written before the Vita Nuova. And he said, no, 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 I can't, I can't, because that would be an act of interpretation. And I am a philologist. What? Was there no interpretation in the decision that he made? Of course. And he makes constant interpretive decisions, but they're interpretive decisions that somehow he decides are not interpretive because he is a philologist. So I actually try to be open about my interpretations and to say, yes, now I'm interpreting. I, I don't know that Lo Doloroso Amor was left out by copyists because in it Dante says something so contrary to the master narrative that those copyists had already received about who this poet was. But at the end of my commentary to that canzone, I speculate that, that if that poem has barely come down to us in five manuscripts, it might be for that reason. But it's speculation, I don't know. And so with respect to the, the decision to have no numbers, and that took quite a lot of work because <laughs> they, had, they had gone, this is 550 pages, those numbers were everywhere. We were finding them into the quinte bozze and the seiste bozze. But that was, a, that was a methodological point to try to bring it back to Dante's authorship. And, and not to mine to that degree. This ordering is only my ordering. It's, it's not Dante's. Um, the Vita Nuova. The Vita Nuova was the enormous obstacle, problem, and finally learning experience for me because it was again not what I wanted to do. I did not set out to do a commentary on the Vita Nuova. And at one point, my editor, Rizzoli, said, well, just leave them out. And that was very, very uh, seductive because that's 31 poems, and then I could have gotten the whole thing done in one volume. But I had already written an article that I think we could characterize as militante, 
which I had published in Lettere Italiane, so Fabio knows it very well since he's an editor of it. And in that article, I had taken De Robertis to task for his decision to not include the um, poems of the Vita Nuova, but indeed, the final decision he made, I, I always remembered, and I took notes. The one conversation that I've ever had with a colleague that I've taken notes about was that conversation with De Robertis. Uh, I went home and I wrote as much as I could everything that he said. And years later when his commentary came out, I saw that he had remained faithful to his idea of being a philologist rather than an interpreter. But because the idea is flawed at its heart, because there is no such thing as, as a philologist who is not an interpreter, it has had I, and continues to have very problematic repercussions. For instance, we now have, I don't know if Fabio is aware of this, but there are now philological circles in Italy where the new thing is to show that the canzoni di stese are in fact Dante's ordering of his canzoni. This makes me very, very annoyed. And one of the, one of, I'm sure that the appiglio that this is founded on is the sentence where De Roberti says that in using Boccaccio's order, he does so con la segreta speranza che tradisca un ordine autoriale. Okay, I mean, see, I'm actually more empirical than that. And I think it's important to be more empirical than that. And so I, I have tried, I have tried to, to bring a certain amount of transparency and clarity uh, in matters of that sort. And not to, it, it, it worries me enormously about the Italian philological tradition that now it's almost as though what we have nothing better to do, we're going to invent now that this is Dante's order because that way we can, we can actually reify it. This, this, is, this is going to be, if Barbara Faeda lets us have a Boccaccio Filologo conference here, that is going to be an issue that, that's going to be front and center. Uh, because, and this is coming back to, to another point, is strangely enough, philology turns out to be kind of at the quick. It turns out to be that you get into, into Critica Militante immediately, faster. When you, when you get into philological matters. And somehow that's because philology brings you faster to culture. It brings you faster to issues of identity, to issues of, of, that are really at the quick, even of scholars, let alone of, of, of human beings. So um, I, that's, that's another way. And then finally, in general, this notion of the crossroads of hermeneutics in philology has become something um, of a structuring principle for me, for all of these authors. So it actually, that actually began with Petrarca because Petrarca just gives us such a wonderful test case of an author who you cannot understand without understanding the fundamental philology of how he constructed the codex, which we call Vaticano Latino 3195. And yet, most people write about Petrarca in total ignorance of that. And I can understand why, because the writing about it is abstruse and it's hard to deal with. So one of, one of the things, again, that I've been trying to do in the book um, of essays that came out of the conference that we had here on Petrarca Filologo for the, for the Petrarca Centenary, and then Wayne Story and I did a collection of essays from that, and that's my essays called At the Crossroads of Philology and Hermeneutics. Um, and that turns out to be an embracing category for this, for this edition and probably for just a lot of the, the work that I'm doing now.